Dialectical Materialism in Psychoanalysis by Wilhelm Reich. 1. Introductory Note The purpose of this paper is to investigate whether and to what extent Freudian psychoanalysis is compatible with the historical materialism of Marx and Engels. Whether or not psychoanalysis is compatible with the proletarian revolution and the class struggle will depend on our answer to the first question. The few contributions so far published on the subject of psychoanalysis and socialism suffer from the fact that their authors lack the necessary insight into either psychoanalysis or Marxism. Among the Marxists, criticism of the way psychoanalytic discoveries have been applied to social theory has been in part justified. The few contributions by psychoanalysts have lacked the necessary familiarity with the fundamental problems of dialectical materialism and have moreover completely overlooked the central issue of Marxist sociology, the class struggle. They were thus useless to Marxist sociology. Oh, they were thus useless to the Marxist sociologist just as a treatise on psychological problems become useless to the psychoanalyst if it fails to mention the theory of the libido. The most unsatisfactory of these works is Kolnai's paper entitled Psychoanalysis and Sociology. Kolnai is an author who has now, without ever having really been an analyst, ended up by being an adherent of Scheller's and has officially, though not unfortunately, before the publication of his pamphlet on sociology, announced that he has given up psychoanalysis because, as he says, it no longer corresponds to his views. The paper bristles with incorrect metaphysical and idealistic interpretations of the discoveries of psychoanalysis and does not deserve to be considered in connection with the present discussion. Juranets, who makes Colney's paper the starting point of a criticism of psychoanalysis, mistakenly describes him as one of Freud's most zealous disciples. We cannot here discuss Juranets' article in detail, but we must make clear from the start that negative criticism of psychoanalysis by Marxists can be justified in two respects. One, as soon as we leave the sphere of psychoanalysis proper, and especially if we attempt to apply psychoanalytic theory to social problems, there is an immediate tendency to build it up into a world of philosophy. It is then set against the Marxist view of the world as a psychological one, which preaches the rule of reason and claims to lay the basis for a better social life by the rational adjustment of human relations and by education toward a conscious control of the instinctual life. This utopian rationalism, <coughs> distorted by, by an over-individualistic -indiv view <coughs> of the social process, is neither original nor revolutionary and goes outside the proper scope of psychoanalysis, which, according to the definition of its founder, <coughs> is nothing more than a psychological method using the means of natural science for describing and explaining man's inner life as a specific part of nature. Psychoanalysis, then, is not a wor world philosophy, nor can it develop such a philosophy. Consequently, it can neither replace nor supplement the materialist conception of history. As a natural science, it is quite disparate from the Marxian view of history. 2. The proper study of psychoanalysis is the psychological life of man in society. The psychological life of the masses is of interest to it only insofar as individual phenomena occur in the mass, e.g. the phenomenon of a leader, or insofar as it can explain phenomena of the mass soul such as fear, panic, obedience, etc. from its experience of the individual. It would seem, however, that the phenomenon of class consciousness is not accessible to psychoanalysis, nor can problems which belong to sociology such as mass movements, politics, strikes, be taken as objects of the psychoanalytic method. And so it cannot replace a sociological doctrine, nor can a sociological doctrine develop out of it. It can, however, become an auxiliary, auxiliary science to sociology, say in the form of social psychology. 
For instance, it can explore the irrational motives which have led a certain type of leader to join the socialist or the national socialist movement, or it can trace the effect of social ideologies on the psychological development of an individual. Thus, the Marxist critics are right when they reproach certain representatives of the psychoanalytic school with attempting to explain what cannot be explained by that method. But they are wrong when they identify the method with those who apply it, and when they blame the method for their mistakes. These two points lead on to a necessary distinction, not always clearly defined in Marxist literature, between Marxism as a sociological doctrine, that is to say, as scientific method, and Marxism as the philosophical practice of the proletariat. Marxist social theory is the result of the application of the Marxist method to problems of social existence. As a science, psychoanalysis is equal to Marxian sociological doctrine. The former treats of psychological phenomena and the latter of social phenomena. And only insofar as social facts are to be examined in psychological life or, conversely, psychological facts in the life of society, can the two act mutually as, a, as auxiliary sciences to one another. Marxism cannot illuminate neurotic phenomena, disturbances in a man's working capacity, or in his sexual performance. The situation is quite different in the case of dialectical materialism. Here, there are only two possibilities. Either psychoanalysis is contradictory to it as a method, i.e. it is idealistic and undialectical, or else it can be proved that psychoanalysis, if only unconsciously, like so many natural sciences, has actually stumbled upon a materialist dialectic in its own sphere and developed certain theories accordingly. As far as method is concerned, psychoanalysis can only correspond to Marxism or contradict it. In the latter case, that is, if the findings of psychoanalysis are not dialectical materialist, the Marxist must reject it. In the former case, he will know that he is dealing with a science which is not contrary to socialism. Marxists have raised two objections against psychoanalysis as a scientific discipline having a right to exist within socialism. One, Marxists claim that it is a phenomenon of the decadence of the decaying bourgeoisie. This objection suggests an inconsistency in dialectical thinking. Is not Marxism itself a phenomenon of the decadence of the bourgeoisie? It could never have become, it could never have come into being without the contradiction between productive forces and capitalist production conditions, but it represented the discovery and hence also the ideological germ of the new economic order taking shape in the womb of the old one. Later, we shall discuss the sociological position of psychoanalysis in greater detail. As for the objection referred to, we can best refute it by quoting the words of the Marxist uh, Whit Whitfogel. I'm sure somebody's going to be pissed at how I pronounce that. Two, Marxists also say that it is an idealist science. A little more knowledge of the subject would have saved the critics from this judgment, and a modicum of objectivity towards psychoanalysis would have prevented them from forgetting that every science, however firmly rooted in materialism, must inevitably have its idealist deviations in a bourgeois society. In theory, formation, if it is, however slightly removed from empiricism, an idealist deviation is understandable and signifies nothing so far as the real nature of science is concerned. Durnitz has taken a great deal of trouble to point out and emphasize the idealist deviations in psychoanalysis. Certainly such deviations exist. They are even numerous. But what matters are the elements of the theory, the fundamental concepts of psychological processes. Psychoanalysis is very often said to be connected with reformist movements in politics. The implication is that reformist philosophers are fond of appealing to psychoanalysis. And indeed, it is true that demand has actually tried to play off psychoanalysis against Marxism in a reactionary manner. I maintain, however, and here I am thinking of some left Marxists, that one can, if one wants to, play Marxism itself off against Marxism, likewise for reactionary purposes. 
anyone who really understood psychoanalysis would never dream of equating Demand's psychology with Freud's, as de Boron has done. What has Demand's sentimental socialism of opinion got to do with the theory of the libido, even if he does make references to psychoanalysis, which, is, which he has never understood? In the last section of this essay, I shall try to demonstrate that psychoanalysis suffers the same fate at the hands of reformism as does orthodox Marxism. That is to say, it is emasculated and made trivial. Meanwhile, let us consider in order the following questions. The materialist basis of psychoanalytic theory, dialectics in the life of the psyche, and the sociological position of psychoanalysis. Two. The materialist discoveries of psychoanalysis and some idealist deviations. Before we demonstrate the great advance in the direction of materialism which psychoanalysis represents compared with the predominantly idealist and formalist psychology which existed before it, we must make clear that we do not accept a certain materialist conception of psychology widespread in Marxist circles and in some others. It is the concept of me mechanistic materialism first put forward by the French 18th century materialists and Buchner and kept alive in the vulgarized Marxism of our own day. According to this view, psychological phenomena as such do not exist. The life of the soul is simply a physical process. To such materialists, the very concept of the soul or psyche is an idealistic and dualistic error. Undoubtedly, this is an extreme reaction to the platonic idealism which continues to this day to dominate bourgeois philosophy. Such materialists maintain that only the body and not the soul is real, that only the objective facts which can be measured and weighed are true, not the subjective ones. The mechanistic error consists in the fact that measurable, ponderable, and palpable matter is identified with matter as such. Marx wrote, the chief defect of all hitherto existing materialism is that the thing, reality, sensuousness, is conceived only in the form of the object, or of contemplation, but not as human sensuous activity, practice, not subjectively. Hence it happened that the active side, in contradistinction to materialism, was developed by idealism, but only abstractly since, of course, idealism does not know real sensuous activity as such. Feuerbach wants sensuous objects, real differentiated, really differentiated from the thought of objects, but he does not conceive human activity itself as objective activity. Marx considered that the question of objectivity, that is to say, of the material reality of psychological activity, of human thought, was a purely scholastic question if isolated from practice. But he wrote, the materialist doctrine that men are products of circumstances and upbringing and that therefore changed men are products of other circumstances and changed upbringing, forgets that it is men that change circumstance and that the educator himself needs educating. There is no question in Marx of the material reality of psychological activity being denied. And if in practice the material reality of the phenomena of the life of the human psyche is recognized, then in principle the possibility of a materialistic psychology must be admitted, even if it does not explain the activity of the soul in terms of organic processes. Unless one holds this view, there can be no basis for a Marxist discussion of any purely psychological method. But in that case, if one is logical, one should not speak of class consciousness, revolutionary will, religious ideology, etc., but should wait until chemistry has supplied the necessary formulae for the physical processes concerned, or until the science of reflexes has discovered the appropriate reflexes. And even then, because such psychology must necessarily remain rooted in causal formalism and cannot penetrate the actual content of feelings and ideas, our understanding of what pleasure or sorrow or class consciousness actually is will not have advanced a lot. This line of thought suggests the necessity within the framework of Marxism of a psychology which deals with psychological phenomena by a psychological rather than an organic method. Of course, such a psychology must do more than merely concern itself with the material facts of the life of the psyche if it is to deserve the right 
to be called a materialistic psychology. It has to be clear about whether psychological activity can be viewed as a metaphysical fact, i.e. a fact outside the organic world, or as a secondary function bound up with and developing out of the organic world. According to Engels, the principal distinction between materialism and idealism is that the latter regards the spirit and the former regards organic matter, nature, as the origin of things. And he emphasizes that he uses the two terms in that sense and in no other. Lenin in materialism in blah. Lenin in materialism and imperial criticism makes another distinction the theme of his critical study of epistemology, namely one's answer to the epistemological question whether whether the world really exists outside the mind and in, in, independently from it, materialism or whether it exists only in the mind as idea, sensation, or perception, idealism. A third distinction connected with the first is whether one believes that the body builds the soul or vice versa. Instead of replying to these questions on behalf of psychoanalysis in general, let us begin by recalling its fundamental theories. Whether the facts on which psychoanalysis is based are true or false can never be a matter for methodological criticism, but only for empirical criticism. Among the Marxists, Thalheimer made the mistake of criticizing psychoanalytic theory empirically and of contesting his findings without sufficient knowledge of the subject, while Jurinitz applied only methodological criticism, again without adequate knowledge of the empirical facts of psychoanalysis. We shall not attempt to prove the theories of psychoanalysis. Such an attempt would surely go beyond the framework of this essay and would, moreover, be fruitless. The proofs are to be found only in our own empirical experience. The Psychoanalytic Theory of Instincts The basic structure of psychoanalytic theory is the theory of instincts. Of this, the most solidly founded part is the theory of the libido, the doctrine of the dynamics of the sexual instinct. The instinct is a borderline concept between the psychic and the somatic. By the term libido, Freud understands the energy of the sexual instinct. According to Freud, the source of the libido is a chemical process, not yet fully understood in the organism and especially in the sexual apparatus and the so-called ero erogenous zones. That is to say, in parts of the body which are particularly excitable and therefore represent points of concentration of physical sexual excitation. Above these sources of sexual excitation rises the powerful superstructure of the libido, a superstructure which always remains connected with its base, changes together with it both quantitatively and qualitatively, as for instance in puberty, and begins to die with it as after the climacteric the libido is reflected in consciousness as a physical and psychic urge for sexual gratification. Freud expressed the definite hope that psychoanalysis would one day be placed firmly on its organic foundations. The concept of sexual chemistry plays an important part as an auxiliary concept in his theory of the libido. However, psychoanalysis cannot methodically deal with the with concrete processes in the organic sphere, that being the proper concern of physiology. The material nature of Freud's concept of the libido is very clearly seen in the fact that his doctrine of infantile sexuality was confirmed by physiologists when they eventually discovered that even the newborn registered evolutive processes in their sexual apparatus. Freud completely disposed of the view that the sexual urge does not awaken until puberty. He demonstrated that the libido goes through certain stages of development from birth onward before it reaches the stage of genital sexuality. He expanded the concept of sexuality by including in it those pleasure functions which are not connected with the genitals but are nevertheless unambiguously erotic in character, such as oral eroticism, anal eroticism, etc. These pregenital infantile forms of sexual activity later become subordinated to the primacy of the genitals. Every phase of development of the libido, 
of whose dialectical character we shall speak later, is related to the actual life of the child. For example, the oral stage is formed in connection with the talking or the taking of nourishment, and the anal stage in connection with toilet training. Pre-Freudian science, caught up in bourgeois morality, had completely overlooked these facts and had merely confirmed the popular idea of the purity of the child. Social rep repression of sexuality had become, become an obstacle to, re to research. Freud distinguished between two main groups of instincts, not further reducible in psychological terms, namely the self-preservation instinct <coughs> and the sexual, sexual instinct. These are linked to some extent with the popular distinction between hunger and love. <coughs> All other instincts, will for power, ambition, greed for profit, he regards as secondary formations, offspring of these two fundamental needs. Freud's dictum that the sexual instinct first appears in connection with the instinct for nourishment should be of great importance in social psychology if a relationship can be established between it and Marx's not dissimilar thesis that in social existence the need for food is also the basis for the sexual functions of society. Later in his career, Freud counterposed the destructive instinct to the sexual instinct and classified the self-preservation instinct under the erotic, inst erotic instinct as a function of the instinct of self-love, self-preservation narcissism. The relationship of this later classification of instincts to the earlier theory has not yet been completely worked out. The leader classification opposing the sexual or erotic instinct to the destructive or death instinct was developed on the basis of the two fundamental functions of organic substances, assimilation, composition, and dissimilation, decomposition. Eros includes all those urges of the psychic organism which construct, combine, and drive forward the destructive instinct Fuck. What the fuck? Eros includes all those urges of the psychic organism which construct, combine, and drive forward. The destructive instinct includes all those which decompose, destroy, and drive back to the initial condition. Thus, psychic development is seen as the product of a struggle between these two opposing tendencies, and this corresponds to a wholly dialectical view of development. The difficulty lies elsewhere. Whereas the physical basis of the sexual and self-preservation instincts is perfectly clear, the concept of the death instinct has no such obvious material foundation. To refer to the organic processes of decomposition is, for the present, a matter of formal analogy only. It can establish no association of content. Only if there is a real relationship between the death instinct and the self-destructive processes in the organism can this view be considered materialist. Nor can it be denied that the, new or the unclear content of this instinct and its refusal to be defined as the, li as the libido can be defined make it an easy loophole for idealistic and metaphysical speculations on the life of the psyche. It has already caused many misunderstandings in psychoanalysis and has led to finalist theory formations and to exaggerations of the moral functions, which we must regard as idealist deviations. According to Freud himself, the death wish is a hypothesis beyond the clinical sphere, but it cannot be by chance that it is so readily seized upon and that it has opened the door to so many futile speculations in psychoanalysis. In opposition to the idealist tendencies which have developed along with the new hypothesis concerning instincts, the present author has suggested that the destructive instinct must also be dependent upon, dependent upon the libido, i.e. he has attempted to classify it within the materialist theory of the libido. This attempt is based on clinical observations. It seems that a man's readiness to hate and his guilt feelings are dependent at least so far as their intensity is concerned, upon the state of his libido economy, and that sexual dissatisfaction increases aggression while gratification reduces it. 
According to this view, the destructive instinct is psychologically a reaction against the failure of an instinct to be satisfied. While physically it consists of a displacement of libid lib libidinous excitement to the muscular system. Clearly, however, the aggressive instinct is also related to the self-preservation instinct. It increases most markedly when the need for nourishment is not sufficiently satisfied. The destructive instinct, in my view, is a later secondary formation of the organism, determined by the conditions under which the self-preservation and sexual instincts are satisfied. <clears throat> the regula regulator of instinctual life is the pleasure-unpleasure -pleasure principle. Everything instinctual is a reaching out for pleasure and an attempt to avoid unpleasure. An unpleasurable tension arising from a need can be removed only by satisfying the need. The aim of the instinct is therefore to get rid of instinctual tension by removing an, an irritation at the source of the instinct. This satisfaction is pleasurable. For example, physical excitation in the genital zone causes an irritation which produces a need, an instinct, to remove this tension. Organic tension in the alimentary organs causes hunger and produces an urge to eat. This causal explanation also deals with the question of aim, since the aim of an instinct is determined by the source of irritation. Here, psychoanalysis is entirely opposed to Alfred Adler's individual psychology, which is exclusively concerned with aims. Since everything that gives pleasure attracts and everything that gives unpleasure repels, the pleasure principle is a form of movement and change. Its source is the organic instinctual apparatus and, particularly, sexual chemistry. After each satisfaction of a need, followed by a short period of rest, the instinctual apparatus tenses itself like a spring again and again. Metabolic processes are possibly at the root of this tension. Yet the working of the two fundamental needs of man is finally given form by the social existence of the individual, which limits the satisfaction of his instincts. Freud brackets all limitations and social necessities which diminish these fundamental needs or defer their satisfaction under the concept of the reality principle. The reality principle is, in part, directly opposed to the pleasure principle insofar as it completely prohibits, <clears throat> prohibits certain satisfactions, and in part it modifies the pleasure principle insofar as it forces the individual to accept substitute satisfactions or to defer satisfaction. For example, an infant may only receive food at certain hours. A girl during the years of puberty may not, in the society of today, immediately satisfy her natural, natural sexual needs. Economic interests, the bourgeois would say cultural interests, force her to keep her virginity until marriage, unless she wants to risk the disapproval of society and reduce her chances of finding a husband. Similarly, the stopping of direct anal erotic satisfaction as practiced by infants is also an effect of the reality principle. But the definition of the reality principle as a social demand remains formalistic unless it makes full allowance for the fact that the reality principle as it exists today is only the principle of our society. There exist many idealist deviations in psychoanalysis concerning the concept of the reality principle. For example, it is often presented as absolute. Adaptation to reality is interpreted simply as adaptation to society, which, applied in pedagogy or in the therapy of neuroses, is unquestionably a conservative view. To be concrete, the reality principle of the capitalist era imposes upon the proletarian a maximum limitation of his needs, while appealing to religious values such as modesty and humility. It also imposes a monogamous form of sexuality, etc. All this is founded on economic conditions. The ruling class has a reality principle which serves the perpetuation of its power. If the proletariat is brought up to accept this reality principle, if it is presented to him as absolutely valid, e.g. in the name of culture, 
This means an affirmation of the proletarian's exploitation and of capitalist society as a whole. It must be clearly realized that the concept of the reality principle as it is in fact understood by many psychoanalysts, psychoanalysts today corresponds to a conservative attitude, if only unconsciously, and is therefore opposed to the objectively revolutionary character of psychoanalysis. The reality principle has had different contents in the past, and it will change again to the extent that the social order changes. The concrete contents of the pleasure principle are, of course, not absolute either. They also change together with social existence. For example, anal satisfaction in an age when it, so much emphasis is laid on clean, cleanliness must be different, i.e. less, and the de desire for such satisfaction must be greater than, say, in a primitive society, and this finds qualitative expression in the formation of certain character traits. One need only think of aestheticism, which is based on anal eroticism, and of the difference between its significance in the bourgeois era and, say, in primitive society or in the Middle Ages. <clears throat> Class, of course, also helps to determine which contents of the pleasure urge, urge will be more strongly or less strongly emphasized. For example, anal urges seem to be much more strongly marked in the middle classes than in the working class, whereas conversely, genital urges are more intense in the working class. This also depends on upbringing and on housing conditions. Biologically, the difference should not, of course, be very great, or at least not decisive. But social environment begins to mold the content of the pleasure principle at birth and whether or not differences in nourishment affect a child's instinctual constitution, even in the germinal phase, influencing the quality and intensity of its urges is a question for future research. The Doctrine of the Unconscious End of Repression Freud distinguished between three systems in the psychological apparatus. The conscious comprising the perceptive function of the sensory apparatus and all feelings and ideas that are actually conscious, the pre-conscious, including all those ideas and attitudes which are not within the conscious at a particular moment, but which can become conscious at any time. Both these systems were well known to pre-analytical psychology, what non-psychoanalytical researchers call the unconscious or subconscious, belongs wholly to what in the Freudian classification is described as the pre-conscious. In the unconscious, Freud's real discovery, which is characterized by the fact that its contents cannot become conscious, becomes a, becomes a pre-conscious censorship prohibits it. This censorship is nothing mystical, but includes rules and prohibitions taken over from the outside world, which themselves have become unconscious. The unconscious includes not only all the forbidden wishes and ideas which cannot become conscious, but also, probably, inherited images corresponding to symbols that the unconscious too changes with time is shown, however, by the interesting clinical fact that with the development of technology, the unconscious acquires new symbols. For example, many patients at the time when at Zeppelins were in the news dreamt of airships as representations of the male sexual organ. As it became clear in the course of research that the unconscious contains much else besides actually repressed material, Freud decided that it was necessary to supplement his theory of the structure of the psychological apparatus. He proceeded to draw a distinction between the id, the ego, and the superego. The id, again, is not anything supernatural, but an expression of the biological sector of the personality. A party of it is the uncon a, fuck, a part of it is the unconscious in the sense just described. That is to say, it belongs to what has actually been repressed. But what is repression? It is a process taking place between the ego and the urges of the id. Every child is born with instincts because society in both the broader and narrower sense, 
the family, will not tolerate it. Incest wish, anal eroticism, exhibitionism, sadism, etc. Social life in the person of educators demands that the child should suppress these instincts. The child, which is only a weak ego and chiefly obeys the pleasure principle, often succeeds in doing this only by banishing the wish from his consciousness and refusing to know anything more about it. Thus, the wish becomes unconscious by repression. Another, more social way of dealing with in unfulfillable wishes is sublimation, which is the counterpart of repression. Instead of being repressed, the instinct is diverted into a socially acceptable activity. Thus, we see that psychoanalysis cannot conceive of the child without society. The child exists for it only as a being in society. Social existence exercises a continuous effect on the primitive instincts, limiting, reshaping, or encouraging them. The two fundamental instincts re react differently to this effect. Hunger is more stringent, more inexorable, and demands immediate satisfaction more violently than the sexual instinct. In no case can it be suppressed like the latter. The sexual instinct is modifiable, plastic, capable of sublimation. Its partial tendencies can be reversed into their very opposites, but cannot completely forego satisfaction. The energy used for social performance, including the performance of those acts which satisfy the hunger instinct, derives from the libido. It is the driving force of psychological development as soon as it comes under the influence of society. The motive force of suppression is the self-preservation instinct of the ego. It gains control of the ego, and psychological development is the product of the conflict between them. If we do not think of suppression as a mechanism and agree for a moment to ignore its effect, we may say that suppression is a social problem because the contents and forms of suppression depend on the social existence of the individual. This social existence is ideologically concentrated in a sum of rules, prescriptions, and prohibitions, that is to say in the superego, large portion of which are themselves unconscious. Psychoanalysis traces all morals back to the influences of education and therefore rejects the assumption that morality is metaphysical in character, e.g. in the sense of Kant's conception of morality. It provides a materialist solution to the concept of morals by tracing it back to experience, to the self-preservation instinct, and to fear of punishment. All morals in a child are the result either of fear of punishment or of love of those who bring him up. If Freud speaks of an unconscious morality and unconscious guilt feelings, he means only that, together with forbidden wishes, certain elements of guilt are also suppressed, as for instance with the ban on incest. Jurenitz has completely misunderstood the concept of unconscious guilt when he says that the assumption of an initially moral quality of the ego and the sense of metaphysical guilt has crept into that concept. Some individual analysis may, for one reason or another, and despite the psychoanalytic method which they practice, believe in an original moral or divine principle in man. That is not part of analytic theory. The exact opposite is true. Psychoanalysis finally and scientifically just finally and scientifically destroys such beliefs by withdrawing the discussion of morals from the sphere of philosophy. We must leave it to the individual analyst to settle the conflict which arises when he tries to combine a belief in God and metaphysical morality with his psychoanalytic convictions. There would be very there would be every reason to worry about psychoanalysis if it began reconciling itself with the metaphysical view. But the theory of unconscious guilt does not, in the least, as Jurnitz fears, cancel out the theory of the unconscious. On the contrary, it demonstrates that the acquisition of a moral sense comes from a material source. We have shown that both the id and the superego, far from being metaphysical constructions, can be traced back wholly, so far as their content goes, to needs or real acquisitions from the outside world. 
I cannot understand where Jurnitz gets the idea that, as in Schopenhauer, so also in Freud, the world is a product of the individual ego created with the object of regulating our needs. The exact opposite is stated by Freud in countless passages, some of which, by the way, Jurnitz himself quotes, namely that the ego is a result of the effect of the real outside world on the instinctual organism and is formed as a protection against irritation. Even in Beyond the Pleasure Principle, Freud's deliberately speculative work, which Jurinitz takes as the principal basis for his critique, there is not a word to imply that the real world is created by the ego. Jurinitz totally fails to come to terms with the concept of projection, which is not discussed in detail in that work. Had he read Freud's clinical writings, he would be clearer on the subject. The ego believes that ideas which it has suppressed within itself and whose pressure it feels are in the outside world. That and nothing else is projection. It was precisely with the help of this materialist theory that Freud was able to discover the true nature of hallucinations in the mentally ill. The voices they hear are in fact only unconscious wishes or pangs of conscience, but that does not make them objectively real. Beyond the Pleasure Principle was, of course, apt to allow incorrect interpretations to crop up in psychoanalysis, but Freud himself has expressed a critical attitude to this work, both within the text itself and on many occasions verbally. He has said that it is outside clinical psychoanalysis, that it can nevertheless offer a point of departure for absolutely unfounded speculations regarding the hypothesis of the death wish is probably due to the libido theory a delicate issue which the bourgeois is only too ready to exchange for a less dangerous hypothesis. The material nature of the ego is unassailable, if only because the ego is linked with the perception system of the sensory organs. Furthermore, as already stated, Freud derives the ego from the effect of material irritations or stimuli upon the instinct apparatus. According to Freud, the ego is no more than especially differentiated part of the id, a buffer or protective organ between the id and the real world. The ego is not free in its actions. It is dependent on the id and the superego, i.e. on biological and social factors. In other words, psychoanalysis challenges free will, its conception of the latter being identical with that of Engels. Free will is nothing other than the ability to decide with full knowledge of the facts. The agreement is so complete that it even finds expression in the fundamental concept of therapy of neuroses by obtaining insight into the, into the repressed matter within himself, i.e. by the unconscious being made conscious, the patient gains the ability to decide with better knowledge of the facts than would be possible so long as his most essential urges remain unconscious. This is certainly not free will in the sense of the metaphys metaphysicians. It is always limited by the patient's natural needs and demands. For example, if a man's sexual wishes have become conscious, he cannot decide to repress them again, nor can he decide to practice chastity permanently. He can, however, decide to live chastely for a certain time. After successful analysis, the ego remains no less dependent on the id and on society than before. It is merely better equipped to cope with conflicts. It follows from the conditions of formation of the ego and the superego super that questions related to social life account for one half of the concrete content of the former and the entire concrete content of the latter. Religious and ethical demands change with the social order. The superego of a woman in the age of Plato was fundamentally different from that of a woman in capitalist society and to the extent that a new society is ideologically foreshadowed within the existing one, the contents of the superego naturally change also. This applies to sexual morality, say, as much as to the ideology of the inviolability of the ownership of the means of production. It also changes, of course, with the position of the individual in the production process. But in what way does social ideology affect the individual? 
the Marxian doctrine of society was obliged to leave this question open as being outside its proper sphere. Psychoanalysis can answer it. For the child, the family, which is saturated with the ideologies of society, and which indeed is the ideological nucleus of society, is temporarily, even before he becomes engaged in the production process, the representative of society as a whole. The Oedipus relationship not only comprises instinctual attitudes, the manner in which a child experiences and overcomes his Oedipus complex is indirectly conditioned both the both by the general social ideology and by the parent's position in the production process. Furthermore, the Oedipus complex itself, like everything else, depends ultimately on the economic structure of society. More, the fact itself that an Oedipus complex occurs at all must be ascribed to the socially determined structure of the family. The question of the historical nature not only of the forms but of the very existence of the Oedipus complex is discussed in the next chapter. 3. The Dialectic of the Psyche We now pass to the question whether the materialist discoveries of psychoanalysis have also revealed the dialectic of psycho psychological processes. First, however, let us recall the fundamental principles of the dialectic dialectical method as established by Marx and Engels and taken up by their followers. Marx's materialist dialectic formed a contrast to the idealist dialectic of Hegel, the real founder of the dialectical method. Whereas Hegel regarded the dialectic of concepts as the initial motive force of historical development and the real world merely as a mirror image of dialectically developing ideas or concepts, Marx reversed this view and made it materialist. In his own words, he put Hegel's construction on its feet by recognizing that material events were at the origin of all things and that ideas were dependent upon them. He took over the dialectical view of events from Hegel, but he rejected Hegel's metaphysical idealism, just as he also rejected the mechanistic materialism of the 18th century. The fundamental principles of dialectical materialism are as follows. One, the dialectic is not only a form of thought, it is also a fact given in mat matter independently from thought, i.e. the motion of matter is dialectical in an objective way. The materialist di dialectician does not therefore endow matter with what exists only in his thought. On the contrary, he directly apprehends through his sensory organs and through his thought, which itself is subject to the law of dialectics, the material happenings of objective reality. It is clear that this attitude is diametrically opposed to Kant's idealistic doctrine. Two, the development not only of society but also of all other phenomena, including natural ones, does not, as every kind of metaphysic, whether idealist or materialist, maintains, occur as a result of a devel development principle or a tendency towards development inherent in matter but out of an inner contradiction, out of contrasts which are present in matter and out of a conflict between these contrasts, which cannot be solved within the given mode of existence, so that the contrasts break down the current mode of existence and create a new one in which new contradictions must eventually occur and so on. Uh, three, everything that results from dialectical development is objectively neither good nor bad, but unavoidable and necessary. However, something that was at first beneficial in a particular period of development can later become an, an impediment. Thus, the capitalist method of production was at first immensely favorable to the development of technical productive forces, but later, owing to the contradictions inherent in it, it began to inhibit those forces. The liberation from this inhibition must come from the socialist method of production. 4. Because of this dialectical development out of contradictions, nothing is constant. Everything that comes into being already carries the seed of its own decay. Marx has shown that a class which wants to consolidate its rule cannot accept the dialectical view because by doing so, it would be pronouncing the death sentence upon itself. He explained that the rising capitalist bourgeoisie created a new class, the proletariat, which, as a result of its conditions of existence, spells the downfall of the bourgeoisie. 
Hence, only the proletarian class can fully and in practice accept the dialectic, whereas the bourgeoisie must, of necessity, continue to cling to absolute idealism. 5. Every development is an expression and a consequence of a double negation, the negation of a negation. To illustrate this, let us once again consider an example from the development of society. Commodity production was a negation of primitive communism, in which there existed only production of consumer values. Socialist economy is the negation of the first negation. It denies commodity production and thus arrives spirally at an aff affirmation of that which was at first denied, the production of consumer values and communism. Contra or six, contradictions are not absolute. They in interpenetrate each other. At a certain point, quantity changes into quality. Every cause of an effect is at the same time the effect of that effect, which is also a cause. And this involves not merely the reciprocal effect of strictly separate phenomena, but rather a whole process of mutual interpenetration interpen and reciprocal action. Moreover, an element can, under given conditions, change into its opposite. 7. Dialectical development takes place gradually, but at certain points it becomes sudden. When water is continuously cooled, it does not gradually turn into ice. The quality water suddenly, at a certain point, becomes the quality ice. That does not mean, however, that the sudden change comes out of the blue. It is developed gradually, dialectically, up to the point of sudden transformation. In this way, the dialectic also resolves, without denying it, the contrast between evolution and revolution. A change in the social order is at first prepared by evolution, labor becoming a social process, the majority becoming proletarian, etc., and then actually brought about by revolution. Let us now, using a few typical processes in human psychological life, try to show the dialectical nature of these processes a nature which, we maintain, could not have been discovered without the psychoanalytical method. First, as an example of dialectical development, the formation of symptoms in neurosis as first discovered and described by Freud. Freud maintains that a neurotic symptom is created because the socially restrained ego at first resists and eventually represses an instinctual urge. However, the repression of an instinctual urge does not, in itself, create a symptom. The repressed urge must break through the repression and reappear in disguised form. According to Freud, the sim symptom contains both the rejected urge and the rejection itself. The symptom allows for both diametrically opposed tendencies. What, then, does the dialectical nature of symptom formation consist of? On the one hand, there are the demands oh, I lost my place, of instinct, and on the other hand, there is reality which prohibits or punishes its gratification. This contradictory situation calls for a solution. The ego is too weak to resist reality, but also too weak to control the urge. This weakness of the ego, which is itself the result of a previous development in which the symptom formation is only a phase, is the framework within which the conflict takes place. It is now dealt with in such a way that the ego, ostensibly serving the dictates of society, but really acting in order not to be punished or destroyed, i.e. following the instinct of self-preservation, represses the urge. Thus, repression is the consequence of a contradiction which cannot be resolved under con conditions of consciousness. The becoming unconscious of the urge is a temporary, albeit pathological, solution of the conflict. Second phase. After the repression of the wish, which has been both denied and affirmed by the ego, the ego itself is now changed. Its conscious is poorer by one component, instinct, and richer by another, temporary peace. The instinct, however, can no more relinquish its urge for gratification when it is suppressed than what it is when it is conscious, if anything, less because it is now no longer subject to the controls of consciousness. 
Repression posits its own destruction, since, as a result of repression, instinctual energy is powerfully damped up until it finally breaks through. The repression. The new process of breaking through the repression is a result of the contradiction between suppression and the increased strength of the, of the damned up instinct, just as repression itself was a result of the contradiction between the instinctual wish and its denial by the outside world, given the condition that the ego is weak. Thus, there is no such thing as a tendency towards symptom formation. We have seen how the development arises from the contradictions of psychological conflict. As soon, there is, as soon as there is repression, there are also the conditions for its breakthrough on account of the increased energy of the damned up unsatisfied instinct. Does the breakthrough of the repression in the second phase restore the initial situation? Yes and no. Yes, insofar as the instinct once again dominates the ego. No, insofar as it reappears in the conscious as a symptom, that is to say, in changed or disguised form. The symptom contains the old element, the instinct, but also at the same time its opposite, the resistance of the ego. In the second phase, symptom, the original contradictions are therefore united in the same phenomenon. That phenomenon itself is a negation, breakthrough of a negation, repression. Let us stop here for a moment to demonstrate this by a concrete example from psychoanalytic experience. We will take the case of a married woman who has a fear of burglars and imagines that they are going to attack her with knives. Let us assume that she cannot stay in a room by herself and suspects a violent burglar in every corner. Analysis of this working class wife yields the following facts. Phase one. Psychological conflict and repression. Before she was married, this woman met a man who pursued her with propositions which she would have liked to accept had she not been morally inhibited. She was able to put off the solution of this conflict by comforting herself with thoughts of eventual marriage. The man gave her up and she married another without, however, being able to forget the first. The memory of this first man disturbed her incessantly. Meeting him again on some occasion, she again fell into an acute conflict between her desire for him and the demands of conjugal fidelity. Under these conditions, the conflict became intolerable and insoluble, the desire for the other man being as strong as her moral sense. She now began to avoid him, resistance, and finally seemed to forget him. It was, however, not a real forgetting, but a repression. She thought she was cured and consciously never gave him an another thought. Phase 2. Breakthrough of the repression. Sometime afterwards, she had a violent quarrel with her husband because he had been flirting with another woman. In the course of this quarrel, as was discovered much later, she thought, If you can do this, then I'm a fool if I stop myself from doing the same. In thinking this, she momentarily saw the image of her first lover before her. The thought, however, was too dangerous since it could conjure up the whole ancient conflict, and so it did not occupy her further. She had once again repressed it, but that night a fear overcame her. She suddenly had the idea that a strange man was creeping toward her bed, wanting to rape her. The instinct had re-entered the conscious in, disguise, in disguised form or e even as its own direct opposite, fear of the stranger had replaced desire. This disguise, phase three, provided the basis for symptom formation. If we now analyze the symptom itself, we shall see that the fantasy image of a strange man creeping into her bed at night satisfies a repressed wish to commit adultery. Analysis showed in detail that the man imagined in the fantasy resembled her first lover in build, hair coloring, etc., without her realizing it. The same symptom, however, also contains an element of defense, a fear of the urge, which appears as fear of the strange man. Later, the element of being raped disappeared from the fear and was replaced by being murdered, thus corresponding to a further displacement of the hitherto excessively obvious content of the symptom. In this example, 
we see not only the joining of initially separate contradictions in a single phenomenon, but also the transformation of a phenomenon into its opposite, the transformation of desire into fear. In such a case, the transformation of sexual energy into fear, and this was one of Freud's first and most fundamental discoveries, the same energy produces under one set of conditions the exact opposite of what it has already produced under another set of conditions. There is yet another dialectical principle to be found in our example. The new element, the symptom, contains the old one, the libido, and yet the old element is no longer itself, but at the same time something entirely new, namely fear. The dialectical contradiction of libido and fear can be resolved in another way, that is to say, out of the contradiction between the ego and the outside world. But before we consider this, we should think of some further, less detailed example of the dialectic of psychology. Of psychology, For example, the transformation of quantity into quality, the repression of an instinctual urge from the conscious, or even its mere repression, is to a certain extent pleasurable for the ego, because it removes a conflict. But beyond a certain point, this pleasure is transformed into unpleasure. Slight irritation of a, an erogenous zone incapable of final satisfaction is pleasurable. If it continues too long, the pleasure is again transformed into unpleasure. Tension and relaxation are dialectical concepts or processes. This fact is best seen in the sexual instinct. Tension of a sexual urge increases desire. At the same time, it reduces tension, i.e. reduces itself, by satisfaction through irritation, so that it is simultaneously tension and relaxation. But tension also prepares for the coming of relaxation, just as, for instance, the winding of a clock prepares for its running down. Conversely, relaxation is connected with maximum tension, e.g. in the sexual act or in the denouement, denouement, denouement of an exciting play, but is also the basis for the renewal of tension. The principle of the identity of opposites is to be found in the concepts of the narcissistic libido and the object libido. Freud maintains that love of self and love of another, object love, are not only opposites, Object love comes out of the narcissistic libido and can be transformed back into it at any point. Insofar as both are love tendencies, they are identical, not least because both derive from a common source, the somatic sexual apparatus and original narcissism. As for the concepts of the conscious and unconscious, these are opposites, but the example of compulsive neurosis shows that they can be contradictory and identical at the same time. Patients suffering from compulsive neuroses banish ideas from their conscious by merely withdrawing attention or effective engagement from them. The repressed idea is at all times conscious and yet unconscious, i.e. the patient can produce it but does not know its significance. Likewise, the concepts id and ego express identical opposites. The ego, on the one hand, is only a specially differentiated part of the id, but under special conditions it becomes its opponent or functional counterpart. The concept of identification not only corresponds to a dialectical process, but also to the identity of opposites. According to Freud, identification comes about in such a way that, say, the person who brings up a child and who is simultaneously loved and hated by the child is absorbed by it. The child identifies with the teacher, i.e. makes the teacher's attitudes or precepts its own. This usually means the end of the object relationship. Identification takes the place of the object relationship and is therefore its opposite or negation. At the same time, it maintains the object relationship in another form, so that it is also an affirmation. This is based on the following contradiction or conflict. I love X because he is my teacher. He forbids me to do many things, and for that reason I hate him. I would like to destroy or eliminate him, but I also love him, and for that reason I want him to stay. From this contradictory situation, which cannot continue as such if the conflicting urges reach a certain intensity, there is the following way out. 
I absorb him, I identify myself with him, I destroy him, I eat my relationship with him in the outside world, but I keep him within myself in an altered form. I have destroyed him and yet he stays. In such situations, which in psychoanalysis are covered by the concept of ambivalence, of yes and no simultaneously, there exist many other dialectical phenomena, of which we emphasize only the most striking, the transformation of love into hate and vice versa. Hate may in reality mean love, and love may mean hate. They are identical insofar as both make possible an intensive relationship with another person. Transformation into the opposite is a property which, Freud says, all the instincts in general possess. In such reversal, the original instinct is not destroyed, but is fully maintained in its opposite. The opposites, perversion and neurosis, too, should be seen dialectically in that every neurosis is a negated perversion and vice versa. A very good example of dialectical development is found in the history of sexual repression over the centuries. Among primitive races, there is a sharp contrast between the incest taboo in respect of the sister and mother and sexual freedom in respect of all other women. But the sexual restriction gradually spreads further and further, at first affecting cousins and later all women at the same gens until finally, as a result of further extension, it is transformed into a qualitatively different attitude to sexuality in general, as for instance, under the patriarchal system, and especially in the age of Christianity. Yet the increased repression of sexuality as a whole produces its opposite, with the result that today, the taboo on relationships between brother and sister has in fact been broken so far as children are concerned. Adults, because of their ex excessively powerful sexual or repression have absolutely lost all knowledge of infantile sexuality so that sexual play between brother and sister is today not regarded as sexual at all and forms parts of the accepted pattern of life in the most refined nurseries. Primitive man may not so much as look at his sister, but in all other respects he is sexually free. Civilized man lives out his infantile sexuality with his sister, but is otherwise bound by the most stringent moral precepts. Let us now examine the extent to which psychoanalysis has uncovered the, dialectical, the dialectic of those psychological processes which concern the individual's general development in society. Two basic questions have to be considered. First, the question as to whether the dialectic of psychological processes can be traced back to the fundamental but resolvable contradictions between the ego, instinct, and the outside world. Second, the manner in which rational and irrational interpretations of the same facts contradict one another and yet merge into one another. In the first section of this article, we have explained that according to Freud's psychoanalytic theory, the individual comes into the world, psychologically speaking, as a bundle of needs and corresponding instincts. Being a social creature, the individual with all his needs is immediately placed in the midst of society. Not only the close society of the family, but also indirectly through the economic conditions of family life, of society at large. Reduced to the most simple formula, the economic structure of society through many intermediary links, such as the class association of the parents, the economic conditions of the family, its ideology, the parents' relationship to one another, etc., enters into a reciprocal relation with the instincts or ego of the newborn. Just as his ego changes his environment, so the changed environment reacts back upon his ego. The needs are partially satisfied. And to that extent, there is harmony. To a major extent, however, there arises a con contradiction between the instinctual needs and the social order, of which the family and later the school act as the representative. This contradiction produces a conflict which leads to a change. And as the individual is the weaker opponent, the change occurs within his psychological structure. Such conflicts resulting from contradictions, which, if the child's psychological structure remained constant, would be insoluble, arise daily and hourly and create the energy for development. True, psychoanalysis does speak of predisposition of development tendencies and so forth, but the facts which have so far been discovered by experience concerning psychological development in early childhood 
suggest only the dialectical development as described above. Progressive movement by means of contradictions from step to step. A distinction is made between different stages of development in the libido. It is said that the libido passes through these stages, but observation shows that no stage is really reached unless there has been a refusal of instinctual satisfaction in the preceding stage. Thus, the refusal of instinctual satisfaction becomes, through the conflict which it causes within the child, the motive force of its development. We neglect that share of this development which is due to heredity because it is difficult to represent it purely as such, as for instance with the disposition of erogenous zones and of the perception apparatus. This is still a more or less uncharted area of biological research, and the question as to the nature of its dialectic does not belong within this essay. We have taken it into account, but we must be satisfied with Freud's formula, according to which instinctual disposition and experience account for more or less equal parts in development. Thus, side by side with the satisfaction of instinctual wishes, the refusal of these wishes plays a dominant role as a motive force of psychological development. The contrast between the ego and the outside world eventually becomes an inner contradiction in that an inhibiting force, the superego, begins to for form within the psychological apparatus under the influence of the outside world. What was originally a fear of punishment becomes a moral inhibition. The conflict between instinct and outside world becomes a conflict between the instinct e ego and the superego. We must not forget, however, that both are materially based. The former fed directly from an organic source, the latter created within the ego in the interests of the self-preservation instinct, narcissism, which limits the sexual instinct and aggressivity. In that way, two fundamental needs, which at first in the infant stage and in many situations later in childhood, formed a unity, enter into contradiction to one another and drive the development forward from conflict to conflict, not only occasioned, but actually caused by social limitations. And although inner and outer conflicts usually determine development, here social existence gives both to the aims of the instinctual wish and to the moral inhibitions which restrain it their time-conditioned ideas and contents. Thus, psychoanalysis fully confirms Marx's dictum that social being determines consciousness, that is to say, ideas, aspirations, and wishes, moral ideologies, etc., rather than vice versa. Furthermore, it adds a concrete content to this dictum as regards the development of children. This is not to deny, however, that both the intensity of needs, which is somatically determined, and qualitative differences in, de in development can be caused by the instinct apparatus. Many Marxists have said to me in discussion that this is an idealist deviation. On the contrary, it entirely agrees with the Marxian principle that man himself makes his history though only under given specific conditions and prerequisites of his social nature. Engels, in one of his letters, expressly rejects the idea that the production and reproduction of reality is the only determining element in the development of ideologies. It is, he says, the determining element only in the final instance. Translated into the language of sociology, Freud's central thesis concerning the importance of the Oedipus complex in the development of the individual means precisely that social being determines that development. The child's instincts and disposition, empty molds ready to receive their social contents, go through the social processes of relationships with father, mother, and teacher, and only then acquire their final form and content. The dialectic of psychological development shows itself not only in the fact that contrasting results can arise out of any situation of conflict, depending on the ratio of forces of the opposing sides. Clinical experience has proved that character traits can, given appropriate conflict situations, change into their exact opposites, which were already present in germinal form when the first solution of the conflict occurred. A cruel child can become the most sympathetic of adults, in whose compassion it would be impossible without detailed analysis to find a trace of the old cruelty. A dirty child can later become a fiend for cleanliness. A curious child can become scrupulously discreet. Sensuality easily changes into asceticism. 
In fact, the more intensively a character trait has developed, the more readily it will change into its opposite, given the appropriate circumstances. Reaction formation. However, as development progresses, the old element is not entirely lost through transformation. While a part of the trait develops into its opposite, another continues to exist unchanged, not without undergoing formal modifications as a result of changes in the personality as a whole. The Freudian concept of recurrence plays a great part in developmental psychology and is repeated or and close examination shows it to be wholly dialectical. That which is repeated is always both the old thing and an entirely new one. The old thing clad in new clothing or performing a new function. When a child which once liked to play with excrement later enjoys building sand castles and eventually as an adult develops a great interest in building, this means that the old element is contained in all three phases, but in a different form and serving a different function. Another example is the story of the surgeon or gynecologist. The former is satisfying his sadism, cutting open, the latter his infantile pleasure in looking and touching. To judge whether or not these findings are correct is not a matter for methodological, but only for empirical criticism. No one who has not analyzed a surgeon can, can challenge this theory. Methodologically, however, he can raise a serious objection, that of the dependence of any human activity on economic living conditions. But psychoanalysis claims no more than that certain particular forces can have an effect on activity. Side by side with the subjective urge, the form which sublimation takes is, of course, economically conditioned. It is above all a man's social position which decides whether he will sublimate his sadism as butcher, surgeon, or policeman. Sublimation may also, for social reasons, prove to be impossible. This then leads to dissatisfaction with the occupation force forced upon the individual by social conditions. Methodology can further raise the question of how the undeniably rational character of an activity is compatible with its equally undeniably irrational meaning. After all, the painter paints, the engineer constructs, the surgeon cuts open, and the gynecologist examines in order to make a living, i.e. for economic rational reasons. Moreover, work is a social, that is to say, a wholly rational activity. How can this be reconciled with the explanation offered by psychoanalysis that man sublimates an instinct in his chosen activity and so satisfies it? Many analysts fail to appreciate sufficiently the rational character of work. They see in the products of human activity nothing but projections and satisfactions of instincts. However, a certain analyst did once jokingly admit that while it was true that an airplane was a penis symbol, all the same, it got you from Berlin to Vienna. The problematic nature of the relationship between the rational and the irrational can be seen again in the following example. The cultivation of the earth with tools and, and the sowing of seeds serves socially and individually the purpose of pro producing food but it also has the symbolic meaning of incest with the mother, mother earth. The rational attracts the symbolic and becomes filled with symbolic meaning. The link between the rational activity and its rational symbolic meaning is to be found in the sequence of actions. The plunging of the tool into, into a material, the implanting of a seed and the production of fruit through such treatment of the material. Hence, the symbolism is justified. We can see that the apparently meaningless has a meaningful core and that the symbolism has a background of reality, the mother, like the earth, after treatment with a tool, penis symbol, bears fruit. The setting up of artificial phalluses on cultivated fields as fertility charms, an objectively useless action of a magic kind practiced by many primitive races, illuminates a particular aspect of the relationship between the rational and the irrational. It represents a magical attempt to achieve a certain end more easily and effectively by irrational means, but it does not mean that rational activity, in this case plowing and cultivating the field, is neglected, and what in agriculture appears as an irrational symbolic element 
namely sexual intercourse, is in itself also a thing of meaning and purpose. It serves the satisfaction of the sexual need, just as sewing serves the satisfaction of the self-preservation instinct. And so we see again that there are no absolute opposites and that the contradiction between rational and irrational can also be solved dialectically. The dialectical fact that the rational contains the irrational and vice versa requires closer examination. Psychoanalytical experience of clinical cases supplies certain answers. It seems that socially purposeful activities may acquire symbolic meaning, but equally that they need not acquire such meaning. When, say, a person dreams of a knife or a tree, this may be a penis symbol, or it may stand for a real knife or a real tree. And if it does appear in the dream as a symbol, this by no means excludes the rational meaning, for if we analytically pursue the question why the penis is represented by a tree or a knife and not, say, by a stick, we will in many cases find a rational explanation. For example, a nymphomaniac patient used to masturbate with a knife, which unquestionably presented a penis. But the choice of a knife was based on the fact that her mother had once thrown a knife at her and in so doing had injured her. And now in her on onanism, onanism, the idea predominated that she must destroy herself with a knife. This behavior, which seemed irrational in its later stage, had once been wholly rational in that it served sexual gratification. Such examples show, and many others could be quoted to show, that everything which appears irrational at the moment of examination once possessed a rational meaning. Every symptom, irrational in itself, has meaning and purpose if it is analytically traced back to its origin. The conclusion to be drawn is that all infantile instinctual actions serving the rational urge for pleasure turn into irrational actions serving the rational urge for pleasure or oh, fuck the conclusion to be drawn is that all infantile instinctual actions serving the rational urge for pleasure turn into irrational actions when they have undergone repression or some similar fate thus the rational always comes first if, for example, we consider the activity of engineering, we find in it certain irrational elements, e.g. the symbolic satisfaction of an unconscious wish. In sublimation, a driving force which once in childhood was rationally directed towards satisfaction is diverted from its original purpose by education and is directed toward a different aim. But at the very moment when the original aim has been given up in reality but retained in fantasy, the striving for it becomes irrational. If the urge finds a new aim in sublimation, then the old striving, which has become irrational, mingles with the new rational activity, appearing now as the irrational causation of their activity. This can be demonstrated schematically by taking the example of a child's desire for sexual knowledge later working itself out by the adult becoming a doctor. Phase 1. The wish for sexual knowledge is rationally aimed at the contemplation of the naked body and the sexual organs. Rational aim, satisfaction of the wish. Phase 2. Refusal of direct satisfaction. The wish loses the possibility of satisfaction. The urge becomes irrational in relation to the person's actual sexual life. Phase 3. The wish finds a new activity having a substantive connection with the first. The person concerned becomes a doctor and is once more free to look at naked bodies and sexual organs as he did as a child. He is doing the same thing and yet something else insofar as it is the same, insofar as his activity relates to the, status or the situation of his childhood. It is now without meaning or purpose, but insofar as it relates to his present social function, it is entirely rational and useful. It is, then, the social function of an activity which decides whether it is rational or irrational. The transformation of the character of an activity from rational to irrational and vice versa also depends on the social position of the individual at a given moment. An action of the doctor's which is without meaning in his consulting room becomes meaningful in his private life, when, for instance, he is making love. Another action, meaningful in his professional work, will lose its rational character if repeated in his personal life. 
These considerations can lead us to realize that psychoanalysis, by virtue of its method, can reveal the instinctual roots of the individual's social activity, and by virtue of its dialectical theory of instincts can clarify in detail the psychological effects of production conditions upon the individual and can clarify, that is to say, the way that ideologies are formed inside the head. Between the two terminal points, the economic structure of society at the one end, the ideological superstructure at the other, terminal points whose causal connections have been more or less explored by the materialist view of history, the psychoanalyst sees a number of intermediate stages. Psychoanalysis proves that the economic structure of society does not directly transform itself into ideologies inside the head. Instead, it shows that the instinct for nourishment, self-preservation instinct, the manifestations of which are dependent upon given economic conditions, affects and changes the workings of the sexual instinct, which is far more plastic, i.e. malleable. In limiting the aims of sexual needs, this constantly creates new productive forces within the social work process by means of the sublimated libido. Directly, the sublimated, sublimated libido yields working capacity. Indirectly, it leads to more highly developed forms of sexual sublimation, e.g. religion, morality in general, and sexual morality in particular, etc. This means that psychoanalysis has its proper place within the materialist view of history at a very specific point, at that point where psychological questions arise as a result of the Marxian thesis that material existence transforms itself into ideas inside the head. The libido process is secondary to social development and dependent upon it, but it intervenes decisively in it insofar as the sublimated libido is turned into working capacity and hence into a productive force. If, however, we recognize the libido process as secondary, we are still left with the question of the historical significance of the Oedipus complex. We have seen that psychoanalysis deals dialectically, even if unconsciously so, with all psychological processes. Only the Oedipus complex seems to be a static exception. There may be two reasons for this. It could be that the Oedipus complex is interpreted unhistorically as an unchanged and unchangeable fact a fact given as part of the nature of man. Or, secondly, it could be that the family form, which is the basis of the Oedipus complex of today, has in fact existed more or less unchanged for thousands of years. Jones seems to represent the first view when, in a discussion with Malinowski on the Oedipus complex in a matriarchal society, he says that the Oedipus complex is fon, fon e origo, of all things. This viewpoint is unquestionably idealist, for to represent the recently discovered relationship between a child and its father and mother as eternal and unchangeable, whatever the society in which the child is living, is reconcilable only with the view that social existence itself is unchangeable. To eternalize the Oedipus complex is to regard the family form which has given rise to it as absolute and eternal which would be tantamount to thinking that the nature of mankind has always been as it appears to, to us today. The Oedipus complex can be assumed to apply to all forms of patriarchal society, but the relationship of children to their parents in a matriarchal society is, according to Malana Malinowski, so different that it can hardly be called by the same name. Malinowski says that the Oedipus, Oedipus complex is a sociologically conditioned fact which changes its form with the structure of society. The Oedipus complex must disappear in a socialist society because its social basis, the patriarchal family, will itself disappear, having lost its raison d'etre. Communal upbringing, which forms part of the socialist program, will be so unfavorable to the, to the forming of psychological attitudes as they exist within the family today. The relationship of children to one another and to the persons who bring them up will be so much more many-sided, complex, and dynamic that the Oedipus complex, with its specific content, content of desiring the mother and wishing to destroy the father as a rival, will lose its meaning. All that is left in a question of definitions. Do we describe real incest as it existed in primeval times in terms of the Oedipus complex? Or do we reserve the term for the forbidden incest wish and rivalry with the father? This not only means 
that the validity of a fundamental psychoanalytic thesis is limited to certain definite social forms. It also means that the Oedipus complex is regarded as a fact which is, which in the last analysis is economically determined and, at least in the form which it assumes, socially determined. Given the lack of agreement among ethnologists, the question of the origins of sexual repression cannot as yet be solved. Freud in Totem and Taboo relies upon Darwin's theory of the primeval horde and interprets the Oedipus complex as the cause of sexual repression. But obviously this does not give sufficient consideration to matri matriarchal society. Conversely, from the viewpoint of the McOfin Morgan Engels School of Research, we can see a possibility of interpreting the Oedipus complex, or rather the family form out of which it arose, as a consequence of sexual repression, which had already set in. Whatever the answer, psychoanalysis would surely be the poorer in possibilities of research in the social and pedagogical fields if it chose, so far as the Oedipus complex is concerned, to deny the dialectic which it has itself discovered in all other spheres of the life of the psyche. Four, the sociological position of psychoanalysis. If we now consider psychoanalysis from the point of view of, soci of sociology, the following questions arise. One, what were the sociological facts which gave rise to psychoanalysis and what is its sociological significance? Two, what is its position in the society of today? And three, what will be its mission under socialism? One, like every other social phenomenon, psychoanalysis is bound up with a particular stage of social development. Its conditions of existence are connected with a certain level of relations of production. Like Marxism, it is a product of the capitalist era, except that its connection with the economic basis of society is less direct. The indirect relations, however, can be clearly traced. It is a reaction to the ideological superstructure, the cultural and moral conditions of modern man in society. The conditions particularly involved are the sexual ones which developed out of ecclesi ecclesiastic ideologies concerning sex. The bourgeois revolution of the 19th century swept away almost all feudal methods of production and created its own liberal ideas in opposition to religion and its moral laws. The break with religious morality, however, had already begun, as for instance in France at the time of the French Revolution. The bourgeoisie seemed to be carrying within it the seeds of a new morality, opposed to the morality of the church in general, and particularly in the sexual sphere. But just as the bourgeoisie, once its power and capitalist economics were established, became reactionary and re-allied itself with the church because it needed the help of the church to control the newly created proletariat. So also it took over in a slightly different form, but fundamentally unchanged the sexual morality of the church. The damming up of sensuality, monogamous marriage, the chastity of young girls, and hence also the fragmentation of male sexuality all acquired a new meaning, this time a capitalist one. The bourgeoisie, having overthrown the feudal system, took over to a large extent the ways of life and the cultural needs of the feudal world. It had to barricade itself against the people by moral laws of its own, and thus imposed increasingly greater limitations on the primitive sexual needs of man. Sexual freedom in the middle class is completely denied, except in marriage. For economic reasons, the young males of the bourgeoisie look to the young women and girls of the proletariat for their sexual satis satisfaction. The insistence on chastity for girls of the bourgeoisie is therefore further intensified. Because of the ideological opposition of the classes and a double standard of sexual morality arises on a capitalist basis. As in a vicious circle, this double standard of sexual morality has a disintegrating effect on the sexuality of the men and an uh, annihilating one on that of the women who as a result of their early development remain chaste or chaste i.e frigid repellent unattractive 
In marriage itself, this again reinforces the double standard, because the man goes on looking for satisfaction among working-class women whom his class consciousness tells him to despise. He is forced to make an outward show of respectable morality, while inwardly he resents his wife. This whole ideology is then inevitably transferred to his sons and daughters. Yet the continuing repression and debasement of sexuality is dialectically transformed into a force which destroys the institution of marriage and the ide ideology of sexual morality. <clears throat> the first stage of the breakdown of bourgeois morals is revealed in the sudden overwhelming prevalence of psychological illness. Official science, itself caught up in sexual repression, despises sexuality as a subject for research and looks with contempt upon the writers and poets who become more and more preoccupied with this burning question. It dismisses the continued increase of psychological illness, of hysteria, and a general nervousness as imaginary, or ascribes them to overwork. At the end of the 19th century, as a reaction against science being the servant of morality, and as a portent of the second scientific phase of the downfall of bourgeois morality, a scientist appears within the bourgeois class itself, who claims that the highly nervous state of modern man is a consequence of cultural sexual morality, and that, generally speaking, neuroses are by their specific nature sexual illnesses resulting from excessive restriction of sexual freedom. This scientist, Freud, is ridiculed and outlawed by official science. He is presented to the outside world as a charlatan. He maintains his position quite alone and remains unheard for several decades. During this time, psychoanalysis is born. The theory horrifies and outrages the whole bourgeois world, not only its scientists, because it strikes at the very roots of sexual repression, upon which so many conservative ideologies are based, religion, morality, etc. Its appearance coincides with other signs of a revolt against bourgeois ideology within the bourgeoisie itself. Bourgeois youth begin to protest against the parental home and create a youth movement of its own. Because it has no connection with the working class struggle, this movement soon disintegrates, but not until it has at least in part achieved its purpose. Voices are raised in the liberal bourgeois press against the tutelage of the church. Bourgeois literature adopts an increasingly free position on moral, on moral questions. But all these phenomena, some of which accompanied the birth of psychoanalysis and some of which preceded it, die out as soon as matters become really serious. Nobody dares to pursue the ideas to their conclusions or to draw logical consequences. Economic interest still has the upper hand and in fact brings about an alliance between bourgeois liberalism and the churches. Just as Marxism was sociologically the expression of man becoming conscious of the laws of economics and the exploitation of, of a majority by a minority, so psychoanalysis is the expression of man becoming conscious of the social repression of sex. Such is the principal social meaning of Freudian psychoanalysis. But whereas one class exploits and another is exploited, sexual repression extends over all classes. Seen from the viewpoint of the history of man, sexual repression is even older than the exploitation of one class by another, but it is not quantitatively equal in all classes. At the time of the earliest formation of the proletariat, at the beginning of capitalism, there was, to judge by Marx's account in Capital and Engels's in the condition of the working class in England, practically, practically no restriction or repression of sexuality among the proletariat. The sexual habits of the working class were distinguished and influenced only by its wretched social conditions and the way that still applies to the lumpen proletariat today. As capitalism developed, however, and as the ruling class in the interests of its own continued profit and existence began to take social policy measures and to practice so-called welfare, the ideological bourgeoisification of the working class set in, and this process is still becoming more intense day by day. Thus, the effects of sexual repression spread to the proletariat, but without ever becoming as extreme as they are in the lower middle class, which is more Catholic than the Pope and follows the moral ideas of its model, the upper middle class, more closely than that class does itself. 
the upper middle class began long ago to liquidate its own standards of morality for its own members. The history of psychoanalysis in bourgeois society then is connected with the attitude of the bourgeoisie to sexual repression, or to pull it another way, to put it another way, to the removal of sexual repression. Two. Can the bourgeoisie live side by side with psychoanalysis for any length of time without damage to itself? Assuming, of course, that the discoveries and formulations of psychoanalysis are not watered down and that it does not gradually, without its apologists realizing what is happening, lose its meaning. The founder of psychoanalysis has had nothing good to prophesy for its future. He believed from the start that the world would, in one way or another, suppress his discoveries because it could not tolerate them. Clearly, he must have been thinking only of the bourgeois half of the world, for the proletariat as yet knew nothing of psychoanalys psychoanalysis and did not know that it existed. Today, we cannot yet tell what the proletariat's attitude to psychoanalysis will be, but there are sufficient symptoms on hand for us to be able to study the reactions of the bourgeois world. The rejection of psychoanalysis is directly connected with the social significance of sexual repression. But what does the bourgeois world make of psychoanalysis when it does not condemn it out of hand? On the one hand, there are the sciences, in particular psychology and psychiatry. On the other hand, the lay public. A remark of Freud's made almost as a joke applies equally to both. I wonder, he said, whether people accept psychoanalysis in order to preserve it or destroy it. If we encounter psychoanalysis in the hands, or rather the heads, of scientific people who have not been properly trained in psychoanalytic method, we hardly recognize it as the work of Freud. All that about sex is true, of course, but oh, those exaggerations. And what about ethics? Analysis is an excellent thing, certainly, but synthesis, after all, is just as necessary. When Freud began to construct his psychology of the ego on the basis of his sexual theory, you could almost hear the sigh of relief being heaved all over the scientific world. At last, the man was beginning to set a limit to his absurdities. At last, the higher force in man was coming into its own. And when all is said and done, morality, after that, it was not long before people were talking only about ego ideals and sexuality was forgotten. The stereotype excuse being that it went without saying. They spoke of a new era of psychoanalysis, of a renaissance. In short, psychoanalysis had become socially respectable. The attitude of the lay public is no less hopeless and, if anything, even more repellent. Under the pressure of bourgeois sex morality, psychoanalysis has been seized upon as a fashionable craze for the superficial satisfaction of lascivious desires. People analyze each other's complexes, chatter about dream symbols over cups of tea in the salons, argue for and against analysis without knowing the least thing about it, only because it deals with sex. Mr. A is enthusiastic about the magnificent hypothesis. Mrs. B, no less is ignorant than he, is convinced that Freud is a charlatan and his theory a soap bubble. Both deplore the one-sided exaggeration of sex sexuality, as if there was nothing else, nothing higher in life. Yet, while deploring it, they talk about sex and nothing but sex. Special societies and discussion clubs for psychoanalysis are being formed in America. The market is good and must be exploited. The public indulges its unsatisfied sexuality. And at the same time, this craze, which they dare to call psychoanalysis, is an excellent source of income. So-called psychoanalysis has become good business. That is how things stand outside the psychoanalytic, psychoanalytical world. And inside, one splinter movement follows another. The pressure of sexual repression is too great for the, analysis, anal, for the analysts themselves. Young stands the whole of analytic theory on its head and turns it into a religion in which there is no longer any mention of sex. Adler, likewise a victim of sexual repression, produces the thesis that sexuality is only a form of the will for power. Once again, psychoanalysis is discarded and an ethical community is formed. Rank, once one of Freud's most gifted disciples, seizes upon ego psychology as an excuse for watering down the concept of the libido. 
develops his theory of the womb and the birth trauma, and finally denies the most fundamental psychoanalytical discoveries. Again and, ge- again, and again, sexual repression fights psychoanalysis and wins. In other respects, too, the marks of social and economic pressure can be seen in psychoanalytic circles. The work done becomes milder, gentler, more inclined to compromise. After the publication of The Ego and The Id, the libido is hardly mentioned for a number of years. Attempts are made to recast the whole theory of neuroses in terms of ego psychology. It is announced that the discovery of unconscious guilt was Freud's real achievement, and that only now the real and essential heart of the matter has been reached. In neurosis therapy, which is a matter of the practical application of a wholly revolutionary theory to man in capitalist society, the tendency toward compromise and capitulation in the face of bourgeois sexual morality can be seen at its most obvious. The the analyst's social existence forbids him, indeed makes it impossible for him, to proclaim publicly the incompatibility of the sexual morality of our day. Marriage, the bourgeois family, bourgeois education, with any radical psychoanalytic therapy of neuroses. Although on the one hand it is admitted that family conditions are deplorable and that the patient's environment is usually the greatest obstacle to his cure, there is, understandably, a reluctance to draw the right conclusions from this fact. Thus it comes about that the reality, principle, and adjustment to reality are interpreted as meaning, not efficient functioning in relation to reality, but in many cases, total subjugation to the self-same social pressures that created the neurosis. It need hardly be pointed out that this is disastrous for the practical application of psychoanalysis to the treatment of neuroses. And so the capitalist mode of existence of our time is strangling psychoanalysis from the outside and the inside. Freud is right. His science is being destroyed, but we add in bourgeois society. If psychoanalysis refuses to adapt itself to that society, it will be destroyed for certain. If it does adapt itself, it will suffer the same fate as Marxism suffers at the hands of reformist socialists. That is to say, death by exhaustion of meaning. In the case of psychoanalysis, above all by neglect of the theory of the libido. Official science will continue to have nothing to do with psychoanalysis because its class limitations prevent it from ever accepting it. Those analysts who are optimistic about the popular propagation of psychoanalytic ideas are making a big mistake. It is precisely this popular popularization which is a symptom of the decline of psychoanalysis. Because psychoanalysis, unless it is watered down, undermines bourgeois ideology, and because furthermore, only a socialist economy can provide a basis for the free development of intellectual and sexuality alike. Oh, fuck. Because psychoanalysis, unless it is watered down, undermines bourgeois ideology, and because furthermore, only a socialist economy economy can provide a basis for the free development of intellect and sexuality alike, psychoanalysis has a future only under socialism. 3. We have seen that psychoanalysis cannot develop a world philosophy out of itself and cannot therefore replace a world philosophy, but it can mean a reassessment of values, and in its practical application to the individual it can destroy religion and bourgeois sexual ideology and can liberate sexuality. These two are precisely the the ideological functions of Marxism. Marxism overthrows the old values by economic revolution and the materialist philosophy. Psychoanalysis does the same or could do the same in the sphere of the psyche. But since in bourgeois society it must remain socially ineffective, its purpose can only be achieved after the social revolution. Some analysts believe that psychoanalysis can reshape the world by a process of evolution and so replace social revolution. That is a utopian dream founded on total ignorance of economic and political reality. The future social significance of psychoanalysis would appear to lie in three areas. One, the area of research into the early history of mankind as an auxiliary science within the framework of historical materialism. 
Early history condensed in the myths, folk rites, and customs of primitive races still extant is method methodologically not accessible to Marxist social theory. But work in this sphere can only be successful when the social and economic training of, an, of analysts is extremely thorough and when individualist and idealist views of social development have been abandoned. Two, the area of mental health, which can only be developed on the basis of a socialist society. The claim for an ordered libido economy within the psyche can only hope to be satisfied on the basis of an ordered economic life. This, in the bourgeois world, is out of the question so far as the masses are concerned and can happen only in the case of a few privileged individuals. Only under socialism would individual therapy of neuroses find its proper range of effectiveness. Three, the area of child education as a psychological basis for socialist education. In this field, because of its discoveries concerning the psychological development of children, psychoanalysis must be recognized as irreplaceable. In bourgeois society, it is condemned to sterility if to nothing worse, as an auxiliary science of the science of education in general. Since in bourgeois society, we can only educate children for living in that society, because education for any other society must, for practical reasons, remain illusory, psychoanalytic, psychoanalytical education methods before the social revolution can only be applied within the rationale of bourgeois society. Those psychoanalytical educators who hope to alter this world while living and working within it must in time suffer the same fate as the priest who visited an unbelieving insurance agent on his deathbed, hoping to convert him, and in the end went home with an insurance policy. Society is stronger than the endeavors of its individual members. Five, the use of psychoanalysis in historical research. The following chapter did not appear in the first edition of the present essay. It was added by Reich to the second edition of 1934. The task of scientific psychology is the investigation of psychical structure formation. Only a psychology which possesses the necessary methods for comprehending and representing the dynamism and economy of the psychical process can be regarded as scientific. In my work on the relationship of psychoanalysis to dialectical materialism, I have attempted to show that psych psychoanalysis is the germ from which dialectical materialist psychology can be developed. Since the bourgeois outlook of most scientists leads to distortions and false fundamental theories entering into their work, any attempt at a dialectical materialist psychology must be preceded by careful methodological scrutiny. In my study of the matter, I rejected the possibility of developing sociological theory out of psychoanalysis because the method of psychology when applied to the facts of the social process must inexorably lead to metaphysical and idealist results and has indeed done so. For this view, I was severely attacked by the amateur sociologists of the psychoanalytical school. At that time, it was clear to me that no psychological method can properly be apply, applied to sociological problems, but it was equally clear that sociology cannot do without psychology as soon as questions of so-called subjective activity or ideology occur. When I finally arrived at a provisional formula which attempted to define the place of psychoanalysis in sociology, Sapir reproached me with contradicting myself. Such a reproach was not difficult to make since I had previously denied the use of psychoanalysis in sociology and now allotted it a specific place within that discipline. It is true that my critics had an easier time of it than I. Some of them continued undisturbed to brew their own special brand of psychoanalytical sociology, whose latest triumph is the thesis that the existence of the police can be explained by the masses' desire for punishment. Others dismissed the whole complex problem with the simple assertion that psychoanalysis is an idealist discipline, which it is best not to worry too much about an attitude which evades a serious problem. Some critics, such as Sapir, contradicted themselves because, while advancing this thesis, they had to admit that psychoanaly psychoanalysis had made a number of fundamental discoveries. 
had established the soundest theory of sexuality, and by discovering sexual repression in the unconscious, had uncovered the entire psychical process, etc. To my question, how is it possible for an idealist discipline to make important discoveries, no answer was forthcoming. Discussion to date concerning the sociological significance of psychoanalysis has been characterized by the opposition of two views. One, that psychoanalysis is individual psychology and therefore cannot explain social matters. And the other, that it is, only not, that it is not only individual psychology, but also social psychology and consequently perfectly applicable to social questions. This discussion has remained entirely verbal without anyone making the attempt to check the various assertions against real facts. When in 1929 it declared that the psychoanalytical method is not applicable to social matters, <coughs> I based my view on applications of the psychoanalytical method to sociology made by psychoanalysts, which were completely in contradiction with Marxism and proved to be false. The fact that psychoanalysis has something important to say in, so in sociology was perfectly clear. The question was only how to avoid the previous absurdities and how to extract the latent value, which, although visible, had until then proved inaccessible. It is true that, it, that I had denied in the banner that the psychoanalytical method can be applied in sociology, but at the same time, I proposed a provisional application of it. This was why Sapir was able to accuse me of inconsistency. I wrote, these considerations can lead us to realize that psychoanalysis, by virtue of its method, can reveal the instinctual roots of the individual's social activity, and by virtue of its dialectical theory of instincts, can clarify in detail the psychological effects of production conditions upon the individual can clarify, that is to say, the way that ideologies are formed inside the head. Between the two terminal points, the economic structure of society at the one end, the ideological superstructure at the other, terminal points whose causal connections have been more or less explored by the materialist view of history. The psychoanalyst sees a number of intermediate stages. Psychoanalysis proves that the economic structure of society does not directly transform itself into ideologies inside the head. Instead, it shows that the, the instinct for nourishment, self-preservation instinct, the manifestation of which are dependent upon given economic conditions, affects and changes the workings of the sexual instinct, which is far more plastic, i.e. malleable. In limiting the aims of sexual needs, this constantly creates new productive forces within the social work process by means of the sublimated libido. Directly, the sublimated, sublimated libido yields working capacity. <clears throat> Indirectly, it leads to more highly developed forms of sexual sublimation, e.g. religion, morality in general, and sexual morality in particular, etc. This means that psychoanalysis has its proper place within the materialist view of history at a very specific point. At that point, where psychological questions arise as a result of the Marxian thesis that material existence transforms itself into ideas inside the head. The libido process is secondary to social development and dependent upon it, but it intervenes decisively in it insofar as the sublimated libido is turned into working capacity and hence into a productive force. Today I would word many of the above statements more clearly and would not subsume religion and morality under the sublimation of instincts. At that time I was only dimly aware of the simple fact, which I have since come to appreciate to a much greater degree, that the psychical structure of, say, a Christian working class woman who supports the centrist party or the fascists and cannot be talked out of her political convictions by normal means of, persu of persuasion has a specific structure which is different from that of the psychical structure of a communist working class woman. For example, her material and authoritarian dependence on her parents in childhood and, later on, her husband have forced her to repress her sexual demands, as a result of which she has fallen into a character state of timidity and sexual reticence which has rendered her incapable even of understanding the communist slogan of self-determination for women. Further, sexual repression, when it exceeds a certain measure or is produced in a certain manner, 
creates a strong bond with the church and the bourgeois social system and makes its victim incapable of a critical attitude. The significance of this question lies not only in the fact that there are millions of such women, but more important still that such thinking cannot be ascribed to their being fooled or befogged. It is the product of a fundamental modification of the human psychical structure to the benefit of the dominant system. Given the practical scope of this and similar questions of mass psychology, I was in, unable to satisfy the demands of Marxist friends who wanted an immediate theoretical reply to Sapir's criticism. Theoretical discussions tend to become sterile unless they are firmly based on concrete practical questions. The question as to the role of psychoanalysis in the class struggle had to be determined on the basis of specific problems of the political movement. Such a method proved in fact fruitful both as regards the critique of metaphysical theories in psychoanalysis and of the theoretical integration of psychoanalysis and Marxist historical research. This integration had to proceed from the clear recognition that sociological questions cannot be approached by psychological methods. But at the same time, it revealed a possibility of making Marxist research in history and politics more fruitful in certain areas, such as those concerning the formation and the effects of ideology by making use of the discoveries, not the method of psychoanalysis. Having arrived at such a recognition, the sociologically untrained psychoanalyst will refrain from the practice of sociology and will learn the method of historical research. At the same time, the economist will be forced to recognize the contradiction within himself when he speaks of class consciousness. If, therefore, I am told by psychoanalysts today that I have modified my strict viewpoint according to which psychoanalysis has no place in sociological research because I myself am now considering mass phenomena from a psychoanalytical angle, my answer is that a rereading of my text of 1929 will convince them that this is not the case. I wrote, the proper study of psychoanalysis is the psychological life of man in society. The psychological life of the masses is of interest to it only insofar as individual phenomena occur in the mass, e.g. the phenomenon of a leader, or insofar as it can explain phenomena of the mass soul, such as fear, panic, obedience, etc., from its experience of the individual. It would seem, however, that the ph phenomenon of class consciousness is not accessible to psychoanalysis, nor can problems which belong to sociology, such as mass movements, po politics, strikes, be taken as objects of the psychoanalytic method, and so it cannot replace a sociological doctrine, nor can a sociological doctrine develop out of it. It will be clear from what has been said thus far that the above remarks are still entirely valid and have merely been made a little more precise. We still cannot give a psychoanalytical interpretation to social problems, i.e. social problems cannot be an object of the psychoanalytical method. The question of class consciousness was not yet clarified when the text was first written, and so I was obliged to say it would seem that today it is possible to speak in more definite terms. Experience has confirmed what was merely hinted at in the banner text, namely that the first precondition of a psychological approach to the problem of class consciousness is a clear differentiation between the subjective and objective aspects of that problem. It also showed that the positive elements and driving forces of class consciousness cannot be psychoanalytically interpreted whereas the forces inhibiting the development of class consciousness can only be understood psychologically because they spring from irrational sources. My critics have often been and are still too rash in their judgments. When science enters a new field, it must first get rid of many old ideas before it can unconditionally view the problems in a new light, and mistakes are sure to be made in the formulation or presentation of certain points. Thus, in order to develop a correct Marxist psychology, it was first necessary to stop trying to apply the psychoanalytical interpretation technique to sociological questions. Only then did it become possible to judge what is rational and what is irrational in the problematic of class consciousness, i.e. to decide how much room should be given to the interpretation of irrational phenomena. To quote an example, if I interpret the revolutionary will as rebellion against the father wherever it occurs, including the sociological sphere, 
I subscribe to the ideology of political reaction. But if I make a concrete investigation of how far the revolutionary will, cor will corresponds to a real situation, to what extent the lack of such will is irrational, the point at which the revolutionary will really will really does correspond to, to an unconscious rebellion against the father, etc., then I have carried the bourgeois preconditionless science ad absurdum, <clears throat> have done authentic scientific work of my own, and have thereby done a service to the working class movement and not to political reaction. For Marxist science is nothing other than the incorruptible exposure of relations and connections as they really are. A clear understanding of method methodology in allocating a place to psychoanalysis in historical research is of decisive, decisive importance for the outcome of every investigation. It is important, therefore, to dwell, to dwell in some detail on the criticism of my views as expressed in dialectical materialism and psychoanalysis, which Eric Fromm advances in his paper on the method and tasks of an analytical social psychology. Fromm writes, an attempt must be made to find the secret meaning and cause of irrational ways of behavior and social life as they so strikingly occur, not only in religion and popular custom, but also in politics and education. If it, psychoanalysis, has found the clue to an understanding of human behavior in the life of the, ins of the instincts in the unconscious, then it must also be entitled and, in, and able to impart essential knowledge about the background causes of social behavior. For society too consists of separate individuals who cannot be subject to any other psychological laws than those which psychoanalysis has discovered in the individual. It seems incorrect to us, therefore, when Wilhelm Reich describes for psychoanalysis only the sphere of personal psychology and, co and contests as a matter of principle, its applicability to social phenomena such as politics, class consciousness, etc. The fact that a phenomenon is dealt with by sociology certainly does not mean that it cannot be the object of psychoanalysis. Just as it is wrong to believe that a subject which is examined from the viewpoint of physics cannot also be examined from, the, from that of chemistry. It merely means that this phenomenon is an object for psychology, and in particular for social psychology whose task consists in determining the social background causes and functions of psychical phenomenon, only insofar as psychical facts are involved. It is unfortunate that Fromm quotes only what I said, what I said psychoanalysis could not do and not what I very clearly stated about the role it should and alone can perform in sociological research namely that of showing how material facts are transformed into ideas inside the human head. That psychoanalysis and it alone can explain irrational ways of behavior, such as every kind of relig religiosity and mysticism is clear because psychoanalysis alone is capable of investigating the instinctual reactions of the unconscious. But it can do this in the right way only if it does not merely take account of the economic factors but is clearly aware that the unconscious structures which are thus reacting irrationally are themselves the product of historical socioeconomic processes, and that therefore they cannot be ascribed to unconscious mechanisms as opposed to economic causes, but only viewed as forces mediating between social being and human modes of reaction. But when Fromm goes further and asserts that psychoanalysis has something essential to impart about the background causes of social behaviors because society is composed of separate individuals, this is a wrong use of words which opens the way to abuses of psychology which Fromm himself would condemn. Insofar as we understand social behavior to mean the behavior of human beings in social life, to oppose personal to social behavior has no meaning since there exists no behavior other than social behavior. Even behavior in a daydream is social behavior, conditioned by social realities as well as characterized by fant fantasy relations to objects. To make the point finally clear, we hope, we must take up Fromm's criticism in conjunction with the official psychoanalytical sociology. We are not talking about fine points, but about quite crude issues. 
There are plenty of instances of human social behavior in which the unconscious instinctual mechanism interposed in human action, which psychoanalysis has described and which are of decisive importance in other phenomena, play virtually no part at all. The point I want to make is that, say, the behavior of people with small savings after a bank failure or a peasant's uprising after a sudden drop in wheat prices cannot be explained by unconscious libidinous motives or as a case of rebellion against the father. It is important to realize that in such cases, psychology can indeed have something to say about the effects of the behavior, but not about its causes or background. The essential point is that capitalism cannot be explained by the anal sadistic structure of man, but that this structure can be explained by the sexual order of the patriarchal system. And society consists not only of separate individuals, that would be a crowd, not society, but of a multiplicity of individuals whose life and thoughts are determined by production relations which act between and upon them and which are totally independent of both their will and their instincts, with the important writer that production relations precisely can modify the instinctual structure at certain essential points, e.g. in the ideological and structural reproduction of the economic system. When we say, therefore, that we can throw light on background causes, we must be very clear which background causes we mean. The essential, the essential point, the point on which we differ from the trends in current social psychology, is that we are aware of the limitations of psychology and of the areas in which it is dependent on other disciplines. We know we can only clarify the mediating, mediating connecting links between basis and superstructure, only the metabolism taking place between nature and man as represented in the psyche. The fact that in so doing, we can also elucidate the way in which ideology reacts back upon the basis through production relations, which have become transformed into structure, is purely a side benefit, though a decisively important one. Why is it so extraordinarily important to draw such precise boundaries? because this is the borderline between the idealist and dialectical materialist use of psychology in the social sphere. The fruits which the latter promises to yield merit the most painstaking and careful precision in formulating our approach. This approach can be summed up as follows. We cannot say anything about the background causes of human behavior in the extra psychical sphere, about the economic laws which determine the social process and the laws of physiology which govern the instinctual apparatus, without immediately embracing metaphysics. There is one further point on which I am obliged to contradict. Fromm and others who approve of my views on other matters, Fromm considers that I am wrong to deny that the psychoanalytical method can be applied to social phenomena such as strikes, etc. Other Marxist friends have argued that the psychoanalytical method can be applied to social phenomena because in its fundamental features, it is a dialectical materialist method. Fromm himself says that my attitude is, as expressed in my sociological empirical work has undergone a welcome change. This is not the case. I avoid applying the psychoanalytical method to social phenomena as much as I ever did, and for the following reason, which I can now for the first time formulate with precision. It is true that we use the method of dialectical materialism to examine social phenomena. It is true that psychoanalysis is a dialectical materialist method of examination. Therefore, the abstract logician might conclude the psychoanalytical method can logically be applied to social phenomena and no harm done. At this point, my friends unconsciously fall into abstract idealist logical thinking. They are right according to the laws of abstract logic. They are seriously mistaken according to the laws of dialectics. A quibble? No, a very simple matter of fact. The method of dialectical materialism is the same wherever we apply it. <clears throat> that much is true. The principles of the unity of opposites, the transformation of quantity into quality, etc., remain the same everywhere. And yet, materialist dialectics is one thing in chemistry and another thing in sociology, and again in psychology. For the method of examination is not suspended in air. 
It is determined in its specific nature by the subject to which it is applied. It is here that the truth of the principle of the unity of consciousness and being is fully revealed. And so the special case of the materialist dialectic of the sociological method is not exchangeable against the other special case of the psychological method. Anyone who argues that sociological questions can be correctly dealt with by the psychoanalytical method is saying at the same time, whether he means to or not, that capitalism could be explained by the methods of chemical analysis. The arguments for this would be the same as those advanced for the validity of the psychoanalytical method applied to social situations. For the social process, unquestionably, involves matter as well as man. Consequently, if it lends itself so directly to psychological investigation, why not to chemical investigation too? The example shows where Fromm's attitude would lead it consistently pursued, would lead if consistently pursued. Fromm is mistaken when he says that the psychoanalysts have come to wrong conclusions in the sociological sphere because in sociology, they diverged from the analytical method. No, they were completely consistent in applying social phenomena such as capitalism or monogamy. The method of interpretation of meaningful psychical content and the method of tracing psychical phenomena to unconscious instinct mechanisms. And that is precisely why they failed, because society has no psyche, no instinct, no superego, as Freud assumes in civilization and its discontents. The real facts, which must serve as the basis for any special application of materialist dialectics, were thus transferred into processes of another kind, in which they do not objectively occur, and the result was nonsense. Nor is it correct to, ass to assume, as Fromm does, that the same subject can be examined simultaneously from the point of view of chemistry and physics. Physics cannot determine chemical composition any more than chemistry can determine the speed of fall. What happens is that two different methods both of which are dialectical materialist, are used to examine two different properties or functions of the same object. Exactly the same applies to sociology. Only scientific jugglers of a certain well-known type can explain the same social phenomenon by means of psychology and by means of sociology and economics. That is, eclect that is eclecticism of the worst kind to examine different functions of the same phenomenon by the appropriate methods and, in the process, to elucidate the mutual coordination and interdependence of these functions. That is dialectical materialism properly applied. Fromm is wrong when he says that social psychology determines the social background and causes and functions of psychical phenomena. An example, the social background and function of religion, morality, etc., are sociological economic functions of a class relationship, the production relation between worker and capitalist. This production relation is determined by private ownership of the means of production, by differences between the use value and the exchange value of labor power as a commodity, i.e. by sociological categories. As a result of the economic measures adopted by the ruling class, this production relation becomes anchored in the psychical structures of members of society, and in particular of the ruled class. Special institutions such as family, school, church, etc. modify the structure and mold it into an organism which will always react in a typical manner. We now face a social psychological phenomenon, say the father-son relationship, and its duality. Subjection plus rebellion against authority, based primarily on the economic relationship and secondarily on an irrational emotional attitude. According to the official psychoanalytical view, it is the emotional relationship which actually creates the father-son relationship, that is to say the phenomenon of an, of an authoritarian relationship between, for example, capitalist and worker whereas in fact the authoritarian relationship exists before the emotional one and is based on the class relationship. Examination of the problem by means of, these, of the sociological economic method leads to the exposure of the class relationship. 
Examination by the methods of psychoanalysis leads to the exposure of the derivative of the class relationship, i.e. to an elucidation not of the social functions, but of the way they anchored in the psyche. But if one proceeds the other way around, if one treats the relationship between various individuals belonging to two different classes as though it were a matter of two psychical instances within the same person, then, although one may not be a congenital villain, one is bound to arrive at the conclusion, which a leading analyst once divulged to me, that the bourgeoisie is the superego and the proletariat the id of the social organism, and the bourgeoisie is simply fulfilling the superego's function of keeping the id under control. I am convinced that Laforgue has a heart of gold, and yet he was obliged to conclude that the existence of the police is due to the masses' desire for punishment, because with the methods of psychology he examined the police as a social institution instead of examining the psychology of the police and its effect on the ruled classes. In a number of, em of empirical sociological studies, I have applied the findings of psychoanalysis to sociology without explicitly commenting upon the question dealt with by that method. Let me explain by quoting an example. The strike is a sociological phenomenon in the capitalist phase of social development. Marxist sociology examines the processes leading to a strike by studying, say, the production relations between workers and capitalists, and the law of capitalist economy according to which the commodity of labor power is bought and used like any other commodity by the owner of the means of production. It discovers other economic laws according to which competition forces the entrepreneur to reduce wages in order to raise the rate of profit, etc. But the strike is but the strike is carried out by the will and consciousness of the workers concerned. That is to say, the sociological fact is psychically represented in a certain specific way. Therefore, psychology must have something to say about the matter. But how? For on the how depends what it will have to say. It will be seen at once that a psychoanalytical study of one or several workers who are on strike can say nothing about the strike as a social phenomenon, nor about its background causes, nor even very much about the motives which lead workers to participate in a strike. Even if we analyze what these workers have in common, i.e. if we practice social psychology, we shall have nothing at all to say as to why strikes occur. In other words, social psychology does not explain the strike either. Uncovering the infantile conflicts between workers and their fathers or mothers has nothing to do with the particular strike in question. It only has something to do, and it is precisely this that ought to interest us, with the common historical economic soil, the capitalist or private economy structure of society, which produces both strikes and conflicts between parents and children. But if one insists upon using the results obtained by psychoanalyzing individual workers to explain the phenomenon of the strike, then the conclusion is inescapable that a strike is a revolt against the father. The fact that in reaching this conclusion, one identifies strike with psychical behavior and a strike passes unnoticed, yet the difference is decisive. It passes unnoticed either because of methodological confusion or for conscious or unconscious reactionary motives, for the conclusions to be drawn from the sociological interpretation are not the same as those to be drawn from the psychological interpretation. The former leads to recognizing the laws of class society, the latter to obscuring those laws. The strike may play a part in the psychical work of the unconscious, say, in the form of a dream, where it has the effect of a day residue, Curiously, this is much less frequently the case than with other phenomena deriving from the sexual sphere. But to explain a strike by such a fact is, an, is as absurd as what Geza Roheim, the official spokesman in culture among the psycho, psychoanalysts, does when he makes assertions about primitive cultures on the basis of the dreams of primitives, instead of explaining the conflictual content of these dreams by the primitive cultures concerned. Thus, the function of psychology is to investigate the behavior of the workers in a strike, not the strike itself. But insofar as the behavior of workers in part determines the outcome of the strike, psychical factors play a role. The case is different when the sociological economic situation is such that it should really produce a strike, yet no strike occurs. In this, 
In this case, the sociological economic method will fail if it sets out to discover an immediate, direct historical economic reason, because the sociological process is here disturbed in its development by a third factor. This third factor is a psychological, social psychological, or mass psychological one, e.g. the workers' lack of trust in the leaders of the strike, the influence of reformist trade union leaders who sabotage the strike, or fear of the entrepreneur. In other cases, the decisive cause may be a fear of material difficulties resulting from the strike. But this be behavior too, while it has a determining effect on the progress of the class struggle, should not be explained only in immediate psychological terms, but also, and this is very important, indirectly in terms of sociology. The influence of reformist trade union leaders is itself the result of a specific relationship which, in the last analysis, is sociological. In one case, it may be explained by superficial fear of dis dismissal, by the deeper fear of rebelling against authority, which in turn is rooted in the infantile relationship with the father. But what causes infantile father bondage and fear of authority? Only the family setup, which is based on sociological and economic factors. And so when we apply the methods of psychology, we should aim only at elucidating the more or less numerous intermediate links between the economic process and the actions of men within it. The more rational the behavior of men, the narrower is the area occupied by the psychology of the unconscious. The more irrational it is, the more sociology requires the help of psychology. This is true especially of the behavior of the oppressed classes in the class struggle. The fact that an industrial worker or the industrial workers as a body aspires to appropriate the means of production requires no comment other than that they are following the same or the simple laws of the pleasure-unpleasure principle. The fact, however, that large strata of the oppressed class accept or even support exploitation in one form or another must be interpreted directly in terms of psychology and only indirectly in terms of sociology. The reason why analytical sociology to date has gone about the task in the opposite way, trying to explain rebellion in psychological terms and taking obedience for granted, lies in the psychoanalytical notion of the reality principle, according to which the pleasure principle is replaced in the adult by adaptation to the demands of reality. But reality includes not only the capitalist law of exploitation, but also man's consciousness of it, which is a consciousness of suffering and therefore leads to a refusal to adapt. The official view is that non-adaptation non constitutes infantile, irrational behavior. Here, one view of the world confronts another. Unlike our opponents, we do not deny that our standpoint is a political one, but we point out that the difference between these two standpoints consists in the fact that the one interprets psychologically as a fundamental predisposition of human nature, what should be explained in terms of sociology and economics, and ignores what psychology really could explain, namely the causes inhibiting the development of social processes, thus, in both cases, creating a diversion from reality, whereas the other standpoint excludes nothing, nothing at all, from the scope of man's capacity for knowledge. Indeed, it aims at bringing everything into the sphere of science, arriving at a scientific view of the world by the systematic application of the method of dialectical materialism in all fields, and in this way making philosophy, insofar as it is the science of the unknown, redundant. To sum up, Conscious or unconscious application of dialectical materialism in the sphere of psychology has given us the findings of clinical psychoanalysis. The application of these findings to sociology and politics leads to a Marxist social psychology. Conversely, the application of the psychoanalytical method to problems of sociology and politics must result in a metaphysical psycho psychologi psychologizing and ultimately reactionary sociology.